We're here with Max Lobotsky. He's CEO of Form Labs, and they've just launched some new printers. And we're going to talk about the market, where they fit into 3D printing, and basically the strategy overall. Hi, Max. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Larry. Thanks for having me. So walk us through some of the history of the company. I know, know you started from MIT, and just walk us through a quick, a quick update of where the company stands today. Yeah, so uh, uh, I started Form Labs with two other MIT students about seven, seven and a half years ago. And um, well, the reason we started the company is uh, we got access to these really powerful 3D printers uh, that places like MIT or other big companies had. And uh, they were really impressive tools that let you go from CAD or an idea to a real thing in a fairly seamless process. Um, but typically those machines at the time cost $100,000 and up. They usually had uh, kind of full-time technicians operating them. And so it wasn't possible for uh, smaller organizations uh, to, to get access to them or ones with less resources. And that's what we wanted to change. Uh, so we decided to create the first desktop professional 3D printer. Um, that was the Form 1, uh, which was uh, about a $3,000 uh, product similar in size to the Form 3 you see here, um, but it was really the first printer targeted at bringing powerful 3D printing to many more people. So, so the idea is that it's is it smaller business, hobbyist, uh, creative pros? Is that the market? Uh, so we've we've expanded a bit since since we started. Uh, really, we're targeting uh, all types of uh, professionals using. 3D printers, so it could be anything from a one-person uh, kind of design uh, consultant to uh, we're at most of the large Fortune 500 companies that make stuff, big automotive, aerospace, et cetera, um, you know, name, name a player uh, like that, and we typically have 10 or 20 machines there. Okay. So the 3D printing market, I mean, now that HP's in the market, it, it's, you know, you got Stratasys, 3D Systems, Ultimaker, a bunch of players. Um, I guess size up the market for me because it seems a little crowded, although additive, additive manufacturing is going to be pretty huge. Um, I guess size up the market and, and what's, what you think distinguishes Formlabs. Yeah, it is a crowded market because it's not such a such a big market yet. It's been growing steadily, and people expect to continue growing. Um, but there's uh, there's there's quite a few players already. There's uh, Stratasys and 3D Systems are kind of the two oldest players who invented some of the core technology back in the late '80s. Um, and uh, then there's been uh, a ton of new companies in the last ten or so years. Um, a lot of new startups uh, and uh, some other big players like HP and GE getting involved. Um, but what we're still uh, pretty unique in is that uh, as far as companies targeting professional users, um, pretty much everyone else in the market is still over $10,000, often over $50,000. HP's machines are over $100,000. Um, and so we're really the, still the, the main company delivering a professional solution for about $3,000. Do you, do you see consumers ultimately getting into 3D printing? So when we, uh, when we got started, um, that was uh, a lot of the kind of hype in the industry was about mass consumer 3D printing, that that, that would come uh, soon. And um, that uh, when we got started, we actually looked at that and we came to the conclusion that it doesn't make sense, at least in the near future, that there isn't that many uh, use cases for a desktop printer um, in the home. And um, it might make sense someday, but the technology has to advance quite a lot. And it's not just the printer technology, you need sort of this complete ecosystem of how people are gonna get the content they wanna print or design it and, uh, and what they're gonna do with it. Um, so I think it's still fairly far away. So as far as industries go, um, what, are, what are your biggest verticals in terms of the customer base and um, what, what are some of the needs that they have specifically for 3D printing? So the, the biggest chunk is uh, what we call engineering and product design and that covers um, uh, uh, all kinds of industries that make plastic stuff, consumer electronics, automotive, aerospace, medical devices. 
their uh, prototyping products. Uh, they're making kind of jigs and fixtures and tools that they use in their factories to produce in high volume, and sometimes they're producing the end use uh, products. So just like a few different samples here. This is a typical, um, it's apart from OXO, the kind of home goods brand, uh, prototype of a coffee uh, machine. And this is made in our high temp resin so they can actually run it with boiling water and all that, a very functional prototype. Um, but then on kind of the other end of the spectrum with consumer goods, this is, um, this is a razor you can actually buy from Gillette uh, today, go to razormaker.com and get a customized razor handle with your name or you know whatever design you want on it. Um, that's something they're actually shipping in volume. So really this wide spectrum. Um, but that's all just engineering product design. Then we do a whole bunch of other things. Uh, and the next kind of biggest chunk is dental. Uh, so these are, it's actually a pair of dentures that's printed in two parts and made in an FDA certified biocompatible material you can actually use in your mouth. So there's a whole wide range of dental applications like that as well. Do you see, do you see the dental market and those sort of uh, the, healthcare the healthcare space overall? Do you think that's like a, gonna be a huge market for you guys? Uh, yeah, definitely. It already is a big chunk and um, there's, there's really a huge amount uh, more potential there. Um, in some ways it advances slower than other areas because of the regulatory kind of overhead. So, uh, but, but it's happening. People are implanting 3D printed parts. They're using them in surgical procedures. Uh, we also do a lot of um, surgical planning models. So a surgeon can get some CT or MRI data before they go into surgery and prepare for it. Um, and there, there's more to come there for sure. What do you see, what does the engineer and the, you know, the, per, the teams involved with prototyping, what do they need out of a system? Or I guess what have you learned since you've been, you know, hatched basically? Yeah, I, at a high level, um, what they want to do is they want to go from their idea, from the thing they want to make to the real thing in as seamless a process as possible. And there's usually a bunch of steps along the way where you either have to compromise on what you want to make because you can't make it or um, uh, yeah, otherwise can't get all the way to the kind of the full concept. So it's kind of this dream of, you know, of having an idea and, and making it real. So to do that, we need to make the machines really reliable. Uh, they need to do exactly what you expect, which isn't really yet the case in most of 3D printing. Um, have, you, have you used a 3D printer before? Yeah, a little bit. Um, I know there's been, you know, a lot of talk about just the shelf life. Like I know for the smaller customers, like the big enterprises, they have these service contracts and, and it, it, they're easier to maintain. But, you know, when you're in education or the smaller companies, you know, sometimes you buy a desktop system and you, you have to fiddle it with it too much almost. Um, exactly. So that's, that's still a big problem. And, and even with those big systems, although often you're paying a lot of money for a service contract, which helps take care of it, but it's, it's nowhere near where what we expect from other kind of consumer electronics products where you take it out of the box and, and it just works. And that's a big thing that we've been pushing. Um, I think we still have a ways to go until we match uh, what people expect from consumer electronics, but we're also pretty far ahead any of the other uh, 3D printer companies in terms of that take it out of the box and it just works. Um, and then there's just like pushing the performance boundaries. And so a lot of that is materials. We've got a range of 20 different materials with different properties, high temperature, flexible, biocompatible. And, and that's, uh, people don't just need the geometry they, they want, they need it made out of the right material. So what, I guess what's the state of the ecosystem right now? Um, I, I mean, it looks like there's a lot of advances on the material side and partnerships and ecosystem being built. Um, but you know, what about the software side and, and you know, who, who are some of your biggest partners that you need to play well with and integrate with? Yeah. So we take, um, models geometry from any CAD software that's out there. And there's a lot of different types of CAD software. CAD is computer aided design software that you design the 3d model in. There's mechanical CAD software like SolidWorks and Autodesk inventor. There's dental specific stuff like three shape. There's um, uh, things for the movie and game industry. And uh, we need to work 
as well as we can with all of them. Uh, there's like a standard file format that you can get out of all of them, and then with some we have um, deeper integrations that make it even easier. Uh, so we're, we're definitely part of this uh, workflow that, that we need to make sure we're, we're working well with all, all steps. Okay. Uh, so I guess, do you see a day where, you know, there are smaller enterprises that are basically doing, I don't want to say mass manufacturing, but where they can actually manufacture a full product line and ship it out and, you know, kind of do things in volume and get some scale? Yeah, that's part of the dream of 3D printing, that it uh, kind of uh, reduces some of the, uh, the investment you need to set up uh, a large-scale manufacturing. You can do it much more incrementally at a machine as you need it. And, and we do have um, small companies doing that. Uh, dental is one of the main areas we see kind of high-volume end-use parts, and sometimes that's coming out of very small dental labs with, with five or ten people. Um, uh, but uh, I think we're it's it's a long road and we're you know only a few steps in um, but we're definitely headed to the place where 3d printing is used to produce a lot of products around you okay um so MakerBot kind of targeted this smaller market too uh, way back when and then they were acquired um, what have you learned from sort of that early history like were they early or, or I guess, how, how do you plan on being different? Well, the, uh, I think the biggest takeaway from MakerBot is that they were focused on that mass consumer, uh, the dream of the mass consumer market. And, um, and it, it didn't make sense, ultimately. They were very far from the product that would be a mass consumer product. So they were kind of stuck in this middle ground of hobbyists, uh, and education users and there's a market there but it, it's not as big as professional users so that's um, probably the biggest takeaway what, what we're doing differently okay um, and you guys launched uh, printers just the other day right um, I guess what walk me through the technology between the what was it low power low system? force air lithography yeah yeah with that um, so I guess walk me through how that technology is different and you know what it what it brings to the table sure so, um, first of all, the printers, this is the Form 3 and the Form 3L. Um, so Form 3 is, uh, is obviously the third generation of our uh, kind of flagship desktop 3D printer. Um, and with this generation, we also release the same technology in a much larger format that can make much larger parts, it's Form 3L. Um, and both of them are built on this new uh, print process that we call LFS or low force stereolithography. And uh, what that does is it, um, there's always some force that's applied to your part as it's printing uh, just from the printing process. And uh, um, because of those forces, you have to hold your parts on these support structures, which um, uh, leave marks on your part and, and they take some work to remove. Um, and there's other defects caused in the part. So the less force you can apply, the more kind of perfect and beautiful of a part you can make. Um, and uh, and that, that's always something people want. Uh, they don't want to compromise because they're using a 3D printer. They want to see the layer lines. They want a part that looks exactly as they've designed it. Uh, so that's, um, uh, and then LFS also helps us to scale it up because as you scale it up, that force problem gets worse. Um, so that's uh, some of the new technology. We also have a new um, uh, optical system that we call the LPU, or light processing unit. And um, this is a laser-based system that's actually modular. So we've got one in the Form 3 and two in the Form 3L. Um, and it's an improved accuracy and, and pointing of the laser, which again translates into kind of better, smoother, higher resolution parts. So the idea is that this gets you to a, a part that's, you know, final production quality much faster? Exactly. Okay. Um, what have you learned from your customer base as you've, you know, been around, you know, a few years now? Um, you know, are there any trends that customers are looking for or seeking out? Yeah. Um, materials is, is one thing that's become a much bigger part of our business. Uh, in the beginning, we had just a small set of materials, sort of general purpose, kind of uh, harder plastics. Um, and that's good if you just need the shape of the thing, you just want to look at it. 
But um, if you want to build it into end use products, if you want to pass certain certifications, you need this much wider range of, of materials and, and that's become a much bigger focus on what we're doing. Um, another piece is uh, uh, most people focus on the printer and just what it produces, but with any printing process, there's some work you have to do afterwards, this post-processing step. Uh, so improving on that, making that more seamless. Um, we, we've, uh, we have a couple of optional accessories called form wash and cure. That, uh, that help you with those steps. And then LFS is also helping to reduce those steps. So it's kind of, a lot of it is like looking beyond the printer. Still a lot more work to do in the, the printer itself, and the printer contributes to some of those steps. Um, but uh, ultimately the printer isn't what you want. You want the finished part that comes out at the end, and it's made out of a certain material, and it goes through a couple of steps before you get there. So we've got to make that whole workflow work really well. Okay. So as far as talent goes, what, what are you looking to hire at your company? Is it, is it more the chemist and the materials experts? We're hiring across the board. Um, every type of engineering, mechanical, electrical, software, materials, uh, sales, marketing, pretty much everything. The whole gamut. <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you do something well and you want to work in 3D printing, uh, give us a call, formlabs.com slash careers. All right. Uh, is there any questions I didn't ask that I should have? Um, I think we covered, uh, covered a bunch of stuff. I got other, other interesting parts here. This is just like the Form 3L build volume to give you an idea of how big it is. Um, uh, actually, you know, one, in, one interesting thing here. Um, you know, a lot of 3D printing is kind of behind the scenes, um, but I, I tried to show some examples of where, uh, where people start to see it, products like Dentures or that Gillette Razor Maker. This is another one. These are um, uh, uh, earbuds that are actually custom uh, made to fit your ear based on a scan of your ear. And there's a, there's a couple companies starting to, to do this. Um, and uh, uh, 3D printer is obviously a core part of that process, but it's um, anyone who's struggled with earbuds that don't fit or you know aren't comfortable, 3D printing is a pretty perfect solution for that. All righty, all right. Thanks for joining us, Max.